morning, everyone, or whatever time of, of date is, uh, wherever you are in the world. My name is Emily Ho, and I'm the director of the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University. We are doing things a, a little bit different today, um, a little bit different than our usual uh, scientific webinars. The, the Linus Pauling Institute represents the lasting legacy of uh, Dr. Linus Pauling uh, that was made possible by many, many supporters with a shared passion for health. So we wanted to create a resource for you uh, for your financial health and help you uh, create your legacy. Uh, this webinar is happening uh, with the expertise of our friends and colleagues at the OSU Foundation who are experts in this area and will help you explore the benefits of charitable estate planning. And this is in support of any nonprofit organization that, that fuels your passion. Uh, joining us today are Audrey Anderson and Stephanie Zeno uh, from the foundation, and I will pass the reins on to them. Uh, welcome, Audrey and Stephanie. Oh, thank you. I forgot to unmute. Thank you, Emily, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to all of our attendees who are joining us today to learn a little bit more about how to create your legacy through philanthropic estate planning. Presenting today are myself and my colleague, Stephanie Zeno. We are both directors of development in the Office of Gift Planning at the OSU Foundation. And we are two of four staff in this office who work directly with donors and our colleagues at the foundation, as well as our campus partners to help our donors make lovely gifts to the organization or the programs that they're most passionate about. And before we dive in, I want to invite all of you to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Stephanie will either respond in the Q&A feature or read them aloud as appropriate. And we've set aside some time at the end of today's webinar to have a live Q&A. And this presentation will be recorded or is being recorded and will be available to you. We will clip out the Q&A section at the at the end of the presentation. So feel free to ask your questions uh, freely. They will not be broadcasted. In today's agenda, we'll cover um, a portion of estate planning, which is focused primarily on how to use philanthropy in smart and creative ways to accomplish multiple goals. We'll first talk about a framework that you can use for thinking about your goals and plans in a holistic way, which can be really helpful if you're starting out for the first time, but also if you're updating ex existing plans. And then we'll talk through some gift options that have unique, ta unique tax benefits and can be used in strategic ways to benefit you, your loved ones, and your favorite organizations. And of course, how you can partner with gift planning, um, use us as a resource in your planning process. And you know, you're here today because you have a connection with the Linus Pauling Institute at OSU. And we're all very aware of Dr. Pauling's wonderful legacy in the field of science and activism, but he also has a very specific and important legacy here at Oregon State. Both he and his late wife, Ava, met here at Oregon State when it was formerly known as Oregon Agricultural College. And they were married for almost 60 years. And when Ava passed away in the early 80s, OSU established the Pauling Peace Lecture in her honor that still continues today. And then after Linus passed away, the assets that were formerly part of his Institute of Science and Medicine were transferred to Oregon State and are now the LPI that you are familiar with. And then also in 2001, LPI created the Ava Helen Pauling Endowed Chair. So you can see there's a lot of le uh, legacy at OSU with the Paulings. So you've heard gift planning mentioned a few times already, but let me define it for you. Gift planning is the process of developing a legacy plan that meets your personal, financial, and philanthropic goals while reflecting your values and passions. So we in the Office of Gift Planning partner with our donors and advisors to consider gifts that are tax-wise and which are best for the donor, their family, and loved ones, as well as the programs they're passionate about. We specialize primarily in complex assets, so think non-cash assets, and structured gift plans. So where do you start? It can be useful to go back to those first principles and identify what matters most to you. Many of us don't know when our time will come, so it can be difficult to know how to plan for what might be left over in our estate. 
So a good place to start is to really think through your goals and priorities for your own financial security. Second, consider what you want for your loved ones, family, friends, caretakers, and other important people in your life. Third, identify your values, causes, passions, and important institutions that you hope will continue well after you're gone. You'll likely find that these areas have a lot of overlap, which can be really helpful to inform your careful planning process. So we always encourage everyone to seek trusted legal and financial counsel, but we know these visits with attorneys can be somewhat spendy, so to make the most of your time, it can be helpful to think through some of these planning questions in advance. So starting with your financial security, ask yourself what are your retirement income needs and wants? Do you have your long-term health care costs addressed? Do you have any diversification or concentration issues, especially as you're transitioning from your income earning years to living off of your assets? When looking at your assets, do you have any non-income generating assets or underperforming assets that need to be addressed? And what are your retirement plans? Do you have qualified retirement plans such as IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, Roths, social security income, it's good to look at all of your income sources. And then ask yourself, are income taxes a concern or a stay or transfer taxes? Do you have a plan for your personal residence, maybe vacation homes or other land that's in your portfolio? Do you have a family business? Are you considering selling that family business to employees or transferring it to the next generation? And then what do you hope for your loved ones? How much do you give to your loved ones? When? Do some of your children, would they benefit more from gifts during your lifetime? Are these equal or equi equitable gifts? Do you have a child who's a successful entrepreneur and another who's a public school teacher? Do you wanna give your loved ones the assets or the use of assets, such as creating a trust that will provide income to your heirs for their lifetime? Are you do you have any concerns with how your heirs will use your assets? Maybe you want to, and restrict those assets just for educational purposes, for example. And then what assets to give? As we'll discuss a little later, there are different tax treatments for various assets um, and when and how they transfer. So that's another consideration to think about. And then of course, do you have anyone in your family um, who may have special care needs and would benefit from perhaps a special needs trust? and then think through what your wealth transferring plans are for future generations, such as grandkids and great grandkids. And then of course your values. What would you like to do with your money that would be the most meaningful to you? What organizations have been an important part of your life? Are there organizations doing work that reflects what you care about most? Do you want to create a legacy fund, perhaps an endowed fund that will exist in perpetuity, one that other family and friends can contribute to over time? Maybe it's in your name or will honor a family member or another important person. And of course, giving is joyful. So whether you do that now or at the end of your life, those plans will bring you joy as you think about the difference you can make. Next, of course, is thinking through what's included in your estate plan your assets. It's important to know what assets you have in your estate and to have a complete picture. Assets can have different tax treatments when given during your life or at death, as well as to your spouse, children, or charities. They also transfer differently. Some transfer by will or trust and others through beneficiary designation. which of course leads us to putting your plans into place. In order to accomplish your goals, you will need to create an estate plan with the necessary documents to ensure that your assets are transferred efficiently and according to your wishes. If you pass away without a valid will or other appropriate instruments such as a trust, then you will have considered to be passed um, intestate and your assets will be distributed, not according to your wishes, but to your state succession statutes. So if you want to leave a bequest for distant relatives, friends, caretaker, excuse me, caretakers or charities, then you will need to create an appropriate planning document. These are some of the most common forms of planning documents that you'll run into. I won't spend a lot of time here uh, due to time, 
But again, this is where trusted legal counsel and financial advising is so helpful. So you can create a custom estate plan that meets all of your needs. So let's talk about smart philanthropy and the charitable gifts that you can use to achieve multiple goals, both now and into the future. There are so many ways to give to LPI and your other favorite organizations. On this slide, I've included some of the most common and popular gifts listed on the left here from the most immediate impact to future impact. And this impact uh, refers to both the impact your gift will have on your benefiting organizations such as LPI, but also the impact that gift will have on you as a donor, the benefits you'll receive and some of the tax incentives associated with those giving vehicles. I'm gonna discuss these at sort of a high level and then Stephanie will delve deeper into how these gifts can be used strategically and with a few examples. So let's start here on the left with outright gifts. So perhaps you'd like to support some cutting edge research or be a part of a program that's getting off the ground right now. And perhaps you have had a really high income earning year and so you would benefit from a charitable tax deduction. You might be thinking about an outright gift. But before you look to your checking account, It'd be wise to consider other assets that you might own that you can give instead, primarily appreciated property such as stock. So there are two benefits to giving appreciated property. The first is that your gift would qualify for a charitable income tax deduction for the full fair market value of that property. And second, the capital gains tax that would be otherwise due on that gift if you sold it outright, this associated with the appreciation of that property since the day that you purchased it, that capital gains tax is actually forgiven. So for example, if you bought $10,000 worth of stock 15 years ago, and it's now valued at $100,000, you could give those shares directly to the OSU Foundation you would get a qualified, um, excuse me, a charitable deduction for $100,000. Your gift would have an impact of $100,000 and you wouldn't have to pay capital gains tax on that $90,000 of appreciation. Another type of appreciated property, of course, that might be on all of our minds right now is real estate. Now, not all organizations are set up to accept outright gifts of real estate, but the OSU Foundation has had a lot of experience accepting gifts of real estate. And there's also other ways you can give real estate, so it's worth considering. It does take a little bit of thoughtful planning um, as it can be more complex and we wanna make sure that it's the right gift for you as well as the foundation. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of appreciation in real estate right now, so it's certainly something to consider. And for those of you who are age 70 and a half or better, there's also an opportunity to make a direct gift from your IRA. This is called a qualified charitable distribution. And while these qualified charitable distributions don't qualify for a charitable deduction, those transfers are excluded from your taxable income. And so that can be a great way to get the most bang from your charitable um, dollar if you say, for example, don't itemize your taxes or you've maxed out on your tax uh, deductions for a given year. Next, we have life income gifts. So if you're concerned about needing your assets during your lifetime, and perhaps you could benefit from some additional cash flow, a life income gift might be a great win-win solution for you. This is a gift plan where a donor makes a gift of cash, stock, or even real estate to create an annuity or a trust. And in return, you receive an income stream for life or a term of years. This income stream can be for you or a loved one. And in some case, the cases, these income payments actually have preferential tax treatment. Then the residual of whatever is left over in the annuity of the trust at the end of your life or the term of years becomes a wonderful gift for uh, LPI. And that gift would be used according to your wishes, usually outlined in a statement of intent or some other document um, created during your life. And charitable remainder trusts are especially popular right now because they can be funded with gifts of real estate. 
And those gifts of real estate can be transferred tax-free. The trust can sell those, uh, that real estate tax-free and the proceeds invested into a trust and mixed portfolio, which can then make payments to income beneficiaries such as yourself or loved ones. And Stephanie will go into a couple of examples later on in the presentation. In another example, perhaps you live in your home and you have plans to live in there for as long as possible. You don't have plans to bequeath your house to children or other heirs. And you'd really prefer that your executor not have to manage the sale of your house after you're gone. And you might benefit from an income uh, deduction. With a retained life estate, you can donate your house during your lifetime to the Oregon State Foundation but retain the right to live in it for the rest of your life or until you're ready to move. You would continue to manage the house like you do normally, and you'd receive an immediate income tax deduction for the value that's associated with the charitable portion of the gift. And then once you uh, move or pass away, then the house is you know, available to the foundation to be used, either perhaps sell it and use the proceeds for a purpose that you've um, determined in advance, or perhaps uh, retain the property to be used for some purpose, such as faculty housing. And then last but certainly not least are requests, which I'm sure are uh, what you think of when you consider legacy giving, and for good reason. These are gifts that cost you nothing now. And so if you have concerns about outliving your assets or you want to have access and control over your assets during your lifetime, should you need them, then bequests are a wonderful way to give, uh, make gifts after you no longer need your resources. And of course, there's lots of flexibility. You can change your will or trust or beneficiary designation forms um, at any point. So these gifts transfer through will, trust, or beneficiary designation form, and they will transfer to the foundation tax-free and are also excluded from your taxable estate. So all of these gifts, um, typically, even though the impact might be well in the future, careful and thoughtful planning now will ensure that they are used exactly as you wish. And legacy gifts are often the most personal and most general generous gifts many donors make to any organization, and they are truly vital to the future success of LPI, Oregon State, and the nonprofits that you care about. So I'll pause here before I turn this over to my colleague Stephanie to see if there's any questions that I can answer. Audrey, we don't have any in the Q&A feature yet. Okay. Okay, terrific. We'll save them to the end then. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and let you take it from here. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I've said, uh, or as Audrey has said, I'm Stephanie Zeno. I'm sort of the uh, the other half of the director of development of gift planning. We have other members of our office on a more senior level, but Audrey and I are uh, the two that are actually based out of the Portland office. So uh, we are frequently down in Corvallis, but um, we also have the, get to enjoy the bigger city. So I'm going to do a deeper dive into some of the gift options that Audrey presented. Um, so let's start with life income gifts. Uh, life income gifts actually function in a circular motion, right? So they work in that a donor gives the asset to a trust or a charitable gift annuity. Um, that trust or gift annuity will pay uh, the donor an income, or sorry, an income stream. And there are some benefits associated with this. So when you give an asset to a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust, the donor receives an income tax deduction and it's a, uh, a partial income tax deduction. And I think that's really important for people to remember because you're gonna actually get income payments from this gift. So the income tax deduction is for what we estimate the remaining value of uh, the charitable gift annuity or the charitable remainder trust will be when the trust terms ends or the gift annuity terminates. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. 
Um, there are some other benefits as well. If you give appreciated assets, this is a great way to um, reduce your tax on capital gain. Some of these income payments portions will actually be capital gain taxes, but that's actually okay because income uh, capital gains are taxed at a preferential rate as opposed to ordinary income. So you can actually have an income payment that has different levels of taxation and this could actually be uh, better than just getting you know, a paycheck that's fully ordinary income. And the third thing that I want to highlight is that they, you can have fixed or variable payments. And this actually is a function of the type of gift that you choose. So a charitable gift annuity is actually a contract that is established between yourself and the organization. Uh, the payout rate that you receive or uh, whoever you shall choose is based on your age. So or the income beneficiary to this age, it's often the donor. So let's just assume that. So that becomes a spe specific rate. We use uh, rates that are set by the American Council of Gift Annuities, which is essentially what 99% uh, of the nonprofits in the country use. And that rate determines, you know, it could be 5.6% of the original uh, um, gift annuity amount. And so you will know what the exact dollar amount you will receive quarterly for the rest of your life because charitable gift annuities continue until a person passes away. That, I mean, there is no end date before that. They are for a lifetime. So that's a great fixed uh, payment option. A charitable remainder trust, however, is a little bit more flexible. And to be quite honest, there are some of my favorite gifts to work on because they're just, uh, they can be used in so many fantastic ways. But charitable remainder trust function, generally, especially with unit trust, which is the most common amount, by a percentage based on the trust principle as valued annually. So what that means is the trust contract will say, oh, say, 5%, um, that's going to be of the trust principal on January 1. That's the income payment that will be received by the, uh, the income beneficiaries uh, for that year. So because that 5% could, is of the principal on January 1 of each year, that payment rate or that payment amount actually will rise and fall with inflation. So, you know, if, if the trust is doing really well and, you know, the stock market's really surging, you could have a very high payment year. That's great. Um, that also means that the trust value could fall because it is going to be invested in a very portfolio. Uh, we actually work with donors on that to help them choose the best option. So that's an option if you choose to have something that's a little more of a hedge against inflation. So why would you consider a life income gift? Well, there's a lot of reason actually. Often people use them as part of their retirement planning process. You know, they'll look at their assets and they may say, oh, I've got a pension or I've got social security and I have other retirement accounts and I, I've got a hold. I, wanna, I, want to, uh, I want to either create a steady fixed stream of income that is sort of a, a safety net for me or, you know, I've got a lot of assets that are already in that steady fixed stream of income. And I, I want something that could rise and fall with the market. So this is a way that you can sort of fill in the gaps. It also helps you create a gift that, uh, you know, you could actually get an income tax deduction, create it now, you know, maybe you're in your, your early 60s, late 50s, still working, you're still in your high peak earning years, and you could use an income tax deduction now. So, you know, you have the option of creating this gift, and then it essentially sits on a shelf until uh, you reach a certain age. Often people do it for 65 when they reach retirement age, and then the payments kick in. So you know, you're, getting, you're getting an immediate tax deduction when you really need it, but then you're getting those payments in the years when you're not having that income stream from, uh, from your, uh, your employment, so to speak. They can also be used for business succession planning. We have seen people put in uh, shares of LLCs and things of that nature as a way to um, sort of divest themselves from their personally owned business and pass it down to the next generation or pass it down to empl uh, employees. 
You can use it to create a steady income stream for loved ones. Uh, we often see this with people who want to support your children through that way. You know, I'm, I'm going to set up a trust and I'm going to have the beneficiaries be my daughter and my son and they will, you know, get this for their lifetime or if they're younger, you know, they could get it for a term of up to 20 years with the trust. Diversification of income is a, an important consideration. Uh, for example, if you're like uh, so many of those who've been in the workforce and we, part of your bonus structure is based on stock in your company, uh, you, you know, you could be approaching retirement and you realize all of your assets are tied up in one kind of stock and that's a little bit dangerous. So you could give some of that stock uh, of, your, of this company and create a charitable remainder trust or a charitable gift annuity that gets invested in other types of assets. And so you have a diverse stream of income, a little bit more of a safety net for you. So, you know, I think the, the key here is it, these can offer great financial security plus philanthropic impact, right? So you have the ability to diversify your assets, uh, get an income tax deduction, do all of these sorts of things, but you're also doing an amazing thing by making a gift uh, and creating a legacy, be it for LPI or any of the other charitable uh, organizations that you really care about. And I, I should caveat this at this time and, and say that not every organization offers uh, life income gifts and some only offer charitable gift annuities because those are a little bit easier for smaller nonprofits to handle. Um, OSU has a lot of experience with these, but you know, if you want to support your local church or other organizations like that as well, um, please talk to them about what they offer. And you may also want to partner with your local community foundation. They may offer these um, types of gifts for you as well. And finally, there's some preferred tax treatment for assets transferred and payments. So we talked about this a little bit. So, you know, when you generally, when you get a, a, a paycheck, it's all ordinary income taxed at that high rate. But you know, if you create a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust, the income payment that you receive is, could be a partial return of principal, so that's tax-free. Um, it could be partial capital gains, so that's taxed at a lower rate, plus ordinary income. So the, it's, it's entirely possible and frequently happens that the entire income payment is not taxed at the ordinary income rate. There are portions of it that are taxed at a lower rate, so just so in general you have a lower, lower taxes of, for that income payment to you. So I want to go into an example of how this works. Um, so this is John and Barbara. Uh, John and Barbara, they're retired and they're revising their plans. They have decided that they would like some additional retirement income for a yearly travel plan. So, you know, they're, they're doing really good. Um, they've saved their money up really well, but they're just thinking, you know, down the road, I think it'd be good to have a, a sort of a separate piece that's kind of flagged for our since they're going to be our travel fund. So the kids are financially secure and they're going to get the bulk of the estate and they want to support LPI's campaign efforts and they would really like to establish an endowed research fund at LPI. So next, uh, they come to a gift planner. They come to say Andrew Norwood with the uh, uh, LPI and or myself and Audrey, and you know, they say, well, we're thinking about this, what can we do? The first question we're gonna ask is, what are your assets? So start thinking about that. So they have their primary home, they've got some cash in an emergency fund, they've got retirement accounts, IRA, they've got a Roth IRA, they've got social security income, and a brokerage account. Oh, and they mentioned, we bought Zoom stock in April, 2019 during an IPO for a $36 share. And Audrey actually looked this number up and this is actually what it went for pre-pandemic. So what do you do? Well, you suggest a charitable remainder unit trust. So John and Barbara can donate $200,000 of Zoom stock to create a charitable remainder unit trust. That $200,000 of Zoom stock had a $20,000 cost basis. So that's a huge amount of growth, right? $180,000 worth of growth. If they had sold that stock and given uh, the asset to, or just the stock outright, sorry, not the stock, the proceeds 
to the Linus Pauling Institute, they would have had to pay taxes on the $180,000 worth of growth. So that's, that's a bad idea. So by gifting the stock directly into a 5% charitable remainder unit trust, they're gonna get a charitable income tax deduction. It's gonna be a partial income tax deduction, but it's still a, a very nice benefit to them. In addition, they're gonna avoid and defer capital gains tax. So they're not gonna pay any capital gains tax when it gets transferred into the charitable remainder unit trust. Uh, the deferral part comes that uh, some of their income payments will be taxed at a capital gains rate, which is lower than the ordinary income rate. So that's a great thing. They decided to choose a charitable remainder unit trust because they wanted that inflationary hedge. These variable payments will benefit from market growth. So remember, 5% of the principal is valued on January 1. That's how charitable remainder unit trusts work. And they've decided to receive payments for the rest of their lives. So if you look on the bottom here where we've got some lovely images of dollar signs, you can actually see what that's gonna look like. So almost $70,000 of an income tax deduction. So they get to use that on their taxes for this year. Any, any income tax deduction that cannot be used um, because of the limits uh, through the tax law, that can be carried forward up to five years. So that's a nice little benefit. They can you know, use this in the years going forward. $190,000, it's actually $180,000 of gains that may not be taxed. And their first year payment is $10,000. That's a pretty good travel fund for, for every year. Um, so they, they, they're excited, they're gonna start planning. And most importantly, they realize that they can uh, designate the remaindering value of the trust for whatever they choose. So they work with the Linus Pauling Institute and they create the Barber and John Research Fund. Uh, that's gonna be a great legacy in their name. And while they work with LPI to sort of create the, the structure of this, you know, what the requirements will be of this fund, the, the fund will not begin until the trust ends, which in this case happens at their, the end of their lifetime. So once they pass away, LPI receives the remaining value of the trust and will use it to create the Barber and John Research Fund. So I wanna switch gears here a little bit and talk about planning with retirement plans. So during, this is a, this is a key feature right now. I, I've seen such an explosion of growth of people deciding to use their retirement plans as part of their charitable uh, planning. And the reason for that is, it, you know, retirement plans from, went from being kind of a small portion of people's estate because, you know, they, they were essentially relying on a pension as opposed to being probably the biggest portion of someone's estate. It's either that or their home. That's generally how it works now. So if you're thinking about your retirement plans, and I should mention that we're mostly talking about tax deferred retirement plans, such as IRAs, 403Bs, things of that nature. When you're looking at this, you know, account that you started with Schwab or Fidelity, and gosh, it's so big. And I, you know, I'd really like to do something with it during my lifetime. Well, there's a couple of rules that we have to think about. So once you hit age 59 and a half, you can choose to pull funds from, excuse me, these retirement accounts without a 10% penalty. Before that, you're gonna have that penalty. So it's best to leave these funds alone unless absolutely necessary that you withdraw them. At age 72, this is uh, with regards to IRAs, we start requiring minimum distribution. So the government says, you know, you've let this money grow tax-free all this time. Now you have to start pulling it out. Um, and when you pull these funds out, there's a certain amount every year you have to take out and you're gonna have to pay taxes on that. So often that's a problem for people because they don't really need the income. They would rather it just continue to grow in their account and they really don't wanna pay taxes on it. So what's the solution to that? Well, there's something called the Qualified Charitable Distribution called the QCD. You may have also heard it referred to as the IRA charitable rollover. And it's 70 and a half, so even lower than the age where required minimum distributions must kick in. You can take out of that uh, money from your IRA, often that minimum distribution amount, and have it sent directly to a qualified nonprofit. Um, so how does this work? It's sort of like monopoly. Uh, you know, you do not pass go. You 
uh, you will not get an income tax deduction for that payment that is sent directly to a charity, but you also don't have to pay taxes on it. So it essentially bypasses uh, your estate, um, your net worth, and it goes directly to a charitable organization. Uh, this is a great way to support current needs, as Audrey mentioned. So there's been a couple of legislative updates that I want to touch on that's really important and specifically affected retirement planning. So in the SECURE Act that came under 2019, uh, they raised the uh, age for required minimum distributions from 70 and a half to 72. So originally the qualified charitable distribution uh, age and the what we call the RMD age were actually the same, that has been changed, but you can still make qualified charitable distributions at 70 and a half. So qualified charitable distributions are still permanent. In 2020, you may have noticed that you didn't have to take the required minimum distribution that was paused by the CARES Act, but that was only for 2020. So this year you must still take your required minimum distribution. So that's how they function during life and how you can possibly use retirement plans to make a current gift through the qualified charitable distribution. Now, what happens when you pass away? Because as we've talked about, these can be the bulk of your estate. So retirement plans are not actually transferred through the probate process. They're transferred for, through a beneficiary designation form. And this is an incredibly simple form. Often you fill it out online with Fidelity or Schwab. Uh, some states will require a spousal approval if you choose to designate a non-spouse primary beneficiary, but that's an easy thing to do. This a spouse signs the form, it gets sent off. Uh, so these forms are great because you can change your beneficiaries very quickly without needing to involve an attorney. It's, it's an easy process. So why would you consider giving, uh, making a charitable gift through a beneficiary designation of your retirement account? Well, that's because they're not exactly tax friendly when you pass away. So tax deferred plans, which are known as qualified plans, are subject to state and federal income taxes and possibly a state tax when the assets are withdrawn. So if you leave your retirement account say your IRA from Schwab to uh, your children. When two things are gonna happen and we call it double taxation. So your state is gonna have to pay taxes on this, uh, on this asset, um, especially if you live in a state that has state tax, it's state to state tax like Oregon does. And uh, they could, uh, your state will also have to pay income tax on these plans because they continue to earn income even after you pass away. It's called income in respect to the decedent, IRD. In addition, those heirs, your kids in this example, when they pull out um, the income from uh, this IRA, they're going to have to pay income taxes on it as well. And that could even bump them into a higher charitable or higher income tax bracket, which is a terrible thing to happen. So all of a sudden, this account that, you know, you thought you were giving this fantastic asset to your kids, it can be eroded by upwards of 40% and sometimes even higher, where if you decide to leave a, your, these retirement accounts to a charitable organization, these bequests are tax-free. And, um, you know, if your IRA is valued at $100,000, the organization, be it us, be it the Nature Conservancy, whoever you choose, they will get the uh, full $100,000 worth of value. We, they don't pay taxes. So the whole value of the IRA is preserved for the use of the charitable organization. So uh, this is particularly important when the SECURE Act came in in 2019. Uh, this created something called the 10-year spin-down rule. We also called it the elimination of the stretch IRA. So before this, many people had used these IRA accounts, these tax deferred accounts, as a sort of trust account for their children. The idea being that you know, they would leave these accounts to their kids, and the kids would then be able to pull distributions out of these IRAs over their lifetime, and essentially it could function as a trust account. Uh, the SECURE Act totally got rid of that. Now this has to be, these accounts have to be spent down within 10 years. And that's a pretty significant tax bite 
and you're really, really eroding the value of the account. So what we suggest is you make charitable requests from these assets first, and then you could use these assets uh, to consider creating a charitable trust, which would spread payments out for a loved one over their lifetime. So you could actually direct an IRA or something of that nature into a charitable remainder trust for the benefit of your children. So we we found a great little workaround. Um, if you have any further questions on that, please contact me. I'm happy to walk you through that in a little bit more detail. So I, I've talked about this a bit, but I want to go into an example because it, it's it's something that we're seeing a lot of, and it's really making people have to reevaluate their estate plans, especially since this just came out in 2019, very close to the start of the pandemic. So in this example, Benny and Beatrice Beaver, they want to support OSU and their family through their estate. They initially leave a bequest to OSU in their revocable living trust. For example, they decide to leave 8% uh, of their revocable living trust to OSU. And they decide to name their children as the beneficiary of their retirement accounts. However, there's a problem. The IRS is going to impose income taxes on the remaining balance of the account if you designate it to a beneficiary other than your spouse. There are a few exceptions, but they're they are pretty rare. So for the vast majority of people, there's gonna be some income taxes involved here. It can erode the account balance of up to 40%. This tax is in addition to the estate tax, so it could be imposed for estates fully subject to the estate tax. And this is, we're talking about the federal level estate tax, which is extremely high right now. The result can be that up to 60% of the set value of retirement plan will be consumed in taxes before your child, relative, or friend receives it. So that asset that you thought were, you were giving them this absolutely fantastic uh, account that will get them through their entire life, all of a sudden it's lost 40 to 60% in value. And that's, that's an unfortunate consequence that a lot of people don't consider. So here's what this looks like. You know, if they left a $500,000 IRA account to their daughter, Belinda, the amount she could receive after taxes is only $300,000. And we got that by 40% of 500,000 is 200,000. So that's the amount they're gonna pay in taxes. Uh, 500,000 minus 200,000 is $300,000. So Belinda all of a sudden has a lot less money than she was expecting. However, given the large impact of these income taxes, Benny switches it up. They leave their daughter $500,000 in appreciated stock. Once they pass away, she receives a step up in basis. This is a great little trick of the tax code, which means that um, her basis went from uh, it's going to be actually that $500,000 is not the price that they originally paid for when they bought the stock. They're just going to get that. She's going to get that $500,000 in basis, which is great for her. Instead, they designate OSU as the beneficiary of their IRA account. So 100% of their IRA balance passes to OSU tax free. So essentially, uh, this is a win win for them. They're still giving the exact same amount of funds to their daughter and they're making a really great gift to OSU. So if I can leave you with any advice, particularly with regards to retirement accounts, it's that planning ahead is the best defense. You know, we don't want to, you to run off the cliff like a coyote and roadrunner. The best thing you can do is sit down with a trusted advisor, sit down with our office, think about these things in details, educate yourself, and make sure that the plan you have structured is going to really work for you and your family. So how you can work with us, um, why would you let us know that we're in your plans or why would you consider involving us in an early stage? First of all, we wanna thank you for your wonderful gift, uh, the, even the fact that you're considering it. We want to ensure that there's clarity and understanding of your plans. The worst thing that could happen, and this does happen with some re regularity, is that someone passes away, we are notified of this lovely gift that's coming to OSU, um, and we have no idea what to do with it because there's been no conversations, there's no information in the actual will or trust. So if you wanted to support the Linus Pauling Institute, and that's not explicitly written down, we have no idea that that's, that was your goal, and that's, that's such a shame. We wanna ensure that your gift stands the test of time, 
So it's something that can be used for many, many years going forward. You can work with us to create a gift plan that meets your goals, both charitable and personal. So, you know, taking care of your children, um, ensuring that your assets are divided as you wish. Consider us part of a team that can go with you. Um, part of the team just as part of your financial advisor and your attorney. And we also want to understand your the appropriate recognition and confidentiality that you choose. You know, do you want this to be completely anonymous? Are you okay with us sharing your story, even just sharing your name? Those are important things to consider. So what we offer is free non-obligation consulting. We're happy to chat with you and your attorneys. We partner frequently with advisors and our campus colleagues. We have both current and deferred gift options. We also have the ability to accept real estate and other complex assets. We handle all the life income gifts as well as probate administration. And we do things like this. We, you know, our, part of our job is education. We want you to make the best choice for you. So materials and presentations, we have lots of those things. Um, I want to mention that our website is a wonderful, wonderful resource uh, that's gonna be put up here in just a second. Um, things like a, a will planner, uh, gift calcul calculators, all of those uh, assets are available on our website and we have lots of brochures that we are happy to send you as you start to think through this process. So thank you very much. Do you have, does anyone have any questions? Stephanie, we did have one question. Um, someone in the audience is hoping that we would discuss donor advised funds. Sure. So uh, donor advised funds, I can touch briefly on this. That's not something the OSU Foundation offers, um, but they're very popular right now, particularly through community foundations. That's where you most often see them. Donor advised funds function in that you give an asset, you know, a, a check, stock, things of that nature to a charitable organization that creates a fund for you that you essentially get to use as a charitable spending account. Uh, you get to choose often the beneficiaries of these, uh, these uh, distributions, shall we say, from the donor advice fund. And there's a trick of the law in that technically you can only advise the holding organization as to which other charitable entities you would like to support. So people often set these up uh, for smaller organizations. So, you know, perhaps they really want to support their church and the local Boy Scout Council and um, the local state park. So a, a great way to do this could be through a community foundation. Uh, you set up the account uh, through one organization, say the Oregon Community Foundation, just given that it's the biggest one in the state. And then you can direct the payments from this uh, fund to the organizations that you care about. Now you only get one income tax deduction, you get it for the original gift of the asset to create the donor advice fund. But they're a great option and people use them frequently to do things like support small capital projects. And I'll just jump in. One, there are some limitations to donor advice funds. Um, I'm thinking of in particular, they cannot receive some types of gifts. So the IRA qualified charitable distribution, for example, those cannot be made to sponsoring organizations, which a community foundation would be one, or mm -hmm. Fidelity. Um, those gifts are reserved for public charities, such as the OSU Foundation. Yes, absolutely. And one other thing to mention with donor advised funds is that oftentimes those funds uh, will still have a balance at the end of the original donor's um, death. And so you can name another organization as a beneficiary of those funds. Now, with community foundations, they might have um, a requirement that the remainder go to them or a portion of the remainder go to support the community foundation. Uh, but for other like fidelity, charitable, you um, should make a plan to distribute those residual funds in some way. Absolutely. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, donor advisor funds could have double fees. So, you know, there could be a fee when you actually set up the donor advised fund. 
with the sponsoring organization. And there could be an additional fee when you choose to make every distribution from the fund. So if you're considering creating a, a what we call a DAF, a donor advice fund with an organization, make sure you read the fine print so that you're getting the most bang for your buck. I'm going to stop sharing right here. Thank you, Stephanie and Audrey, uh, for tons of information uh, that uh, are just great, great resources that we have in you as uh, our experts at the OSU Foundation. I'm not seeing any other questions, um, but again, um, in the chat, there are the contact information for both Audrey and Stephanie. Um, if you have uh, additional questions, uh, the presentation recordings will also be sent to all of you as well if you want to revisit um, or review any of this information um, at a later time. But let me thank uh, Stephanie and Audrey for joining us today and thank all of you for, for being here. Uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you more in the future. <laughs>